Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Picture the situation. You've got a shiny new rocket. It's all filled with propellant on the pad. You count down to zero. It lifts off and begins to turn in the wrong direction. What do you do? Well, it's time to resort to the flight termination system. Those contingency plans are designed to make sure that that rocket will not become a ballistic missile and threaten people not involved in the launch. So over the years, we've seen a lot of different ways of dealing with this situation. At the Soviet Union, they basically would have a manual command to shut down the engines on their rocket. And that works pretty well, although in the case of the Proton, there was one unfortunate incident early on where the vehicle fell back so close to the launch site that the clouds of toxic hypergolic propellants stopped the crowds of assembled dignitaries from leaving <laughs> due to the toxicity. Uh, you know, we still see that in Western designs. We see that, like, I think Astra's very small rocket they primarily command a termination of the engines and it falls into the ocean. We saw that with their famous Space Y launch where it wasn't proceeding with enough power and at a certain point they just cut the engines and let it fall into the ocean. But I'm mostly interested in the kind of flight termination system which actually leads to vehicle destruction pretty rapidly. And believe it or not, in the US, there are some very strict, uh, detailed re <laughs> regulations as a private pilot, I had to read and learn the Federal Aviation Regulations, also known as the FAR. And uh, there is actually a section, not in this book because this is only private pilot, but there's part 417 which concerns spaceflight safety and Appendix D goes into the requirements for what a flight termination system should have. They say that the hardware must be independent from the rest of the launch vehicle system, so it can't be just a subroutine in your software. It has to have a predicted reliability of a 0.999, that's a 0.1% failure rate. There must be no single point of failure, which means that you have to have duplicates for everything. Duplicate antennas, duplicate receivers, duplicate command processors. Uh, you then need, of course, duplicate actuation systems. And for example, if you've got an explosive, that means you need two different detonators with two independent you know, triggering systems. like so that no single point of failure can work. It also requires that there be, for high energy systems, that there be like mechanical, electromechanical interlocks. So that would mean that there may be some physical switch that has to move position to arm and disarm the system. And when it's on the ground, you can put a pin in it to make sure that even if there's an electrical signal, that thing will never move to the arm position and therefore can never be accidentally triggered. This is of course really important, say, if you're working around the pad, but you also want to disarm your flight termination system if you're, say, going to recover your boosters afterwards. So yeah, uh, the flight termination systems must also include an automatic or inadvertent separation destruct system. That is the case where a stage breaks up and you maybe don't have independent hardware on every single solid rocket motor, but you might have some connection that if it's broken, says you have detached before you should, you are going to have to you know, self-terminate. Uh, you'll find like brake wires all over the body in key positions so that if the rocket begins to suffer a structural failure, this will trigger the destruction system. Uh, when the destruct system should trigger, it needs to be able to render each propulsion system that has the capability of reaching a populated or otherwise protected area incapable of propulsion without significant or lateral longitudinal deviation in the impact point, which means that when it's triggered, it needs to stop any change in the impact point as quickly as possible. Um, it needs to be able to terminate the flight of any inadvertently or prematurely separated propulsion system, right? So that's like the solid rocket motors. You need to destroy the pressure integrity of any solid propellant system to terminate all thrust uh, or ensure that any residual thrust causes the propulsion system to tumble. So that way you can like blow out a port on the side of your solid rocket motors and have them spin end over end. And you also need to disperse any liquid propellant either by rupturing the propellant tank or some other system where you maybe initiate a burn, uh, preferably any giant fireball. And ideally, you want to burn off any toxic propellant before the vehicle hits the surface. So yeah, the US regulations have that the, the flight termination system has to be logically separate from the rest of the rocket systems. And so you can imagine it as like a simple end-to-end -end system with antennas at one end that are receiving like you know, GPS and commands from the ground, you know, telemetry.
that they, they'll maybe have like some processing units. It might be receiving some data from the rocket, but it won't be sending commands back to the rocket itself. It doesn't want to rely on any of that. There'll be a pair of batteries, of course, for redundancy. The processing units will both do their own thing. And if they decide to initiate uh, an explosive, you'll have the initiator systems for the explosives with their relevant interlocks. And finally, the explosives, which actually perform the job. And so you can imagine that in ground control, there is somebody that is sitting next to a big red button that has the authority to push that to terminate the flight. And I say big red button. Usually there's a couple of stages that are needed, like, a, you know, maybe open a cover, flick a switch, push a button. Something that you can do very quickly, but you can't do accidentally. And that's the important part. But like, and so in the old days, you would have, but uh, observers, you would have like ground radar that would be tracking it. You would have observers on the ground. And in the early launches, they literally had people sitting at like 90 degrees to the launch site, looking through uh, like a frame of wood with wires that were strung across. And they could look through this. And if the rocket went beyond this, they would call out the destruct. Uh, later on, of course, you've got radar. But uh, there's, I mean, there's one great video that I found recently of observers shouting to terminate a launch at Vandenberg. It's spectacular. Ignition. Copy ignition. Lift off. Copy left off. Back as green. Copy back as green. Program back. Program it's going the wrong way, Mark. Good function. Program RT is out. Back as red. Back as red. <clears throat> okay, we have confirmation of destruct on video. Back, back as take cover. Back as copy, take, take cover. cover. But nowadays, with the advancement of technology, we're moving on towards more automated flight termination systems. This is the, the system has enough logic and capability to actually understand the rocket trajectory, to understand where it's supposed to be, that the rocket knows where it is, and it knows exactly where it isn't, because if it's going that way, it needs to terminate the flight. So automated flight termination systems are becoming sort of the standard thing on almost all new rockets. And they've gone back like about 20 years um, as like fully capable systems. The NASA started developing an automated flight termination system back uh, about 20 years ago and actually flew a test payload on the very first Falcon 1. That never got used because the Falcon 1 had a fuel leak which caused it to fall back to the ground. But um, that development of automated flight termination systems was flown on uh, you know, Falcon 9 for a long time. They eventually turned it on. And that was important because the Falcon 9 has this capability to launch to polar orbits from Cape Canaveral, which other rockets aren't allowed to do. So to make these polar launches, it has to sort of turn south along the coast, skirt around Miami, and then make a dogleg turn. And to do this, for the range safety, or sorry, the licensing requires that the rockets that want to do this have to have an automated flight termination system on board. So if communications is lost and it's heading towards Miami, the thing will destroy itself before that happens. Um, Electron, Rocket Lab, they developed a whole autonomous flight termination system. They actually used the NASA one. They had some issues getting it finally approved for flight, but yeah, they now use that. And I'm presuming that other rockets going forward are going to have this. Now, while the electronics have changed over the years, keeping up with modern standards, there's one part in these flight termination systems which are pretty much unchanged since the 1960s, and that is the initiators. So, the design is, that's used is called the NASA Standard Initiator, and it was actually derived from the single bridge wire Apollo Standard Initiator that was developed in 1966. And those were used in Apollo, they're used on the space shuttle. I believe that ULA is using them. I'm pretty sure that SpaceX is using them. Why? Because they are standard, they are reliable. Now, like SpaceX uses the design, they build their own, but the whole point is, these things have been well developed, well understood, and they are known when built right to have like a practically 100% success rate. So they, uh, you basically have two contacts going in. There's a tiny little wire in there and that's inside a powdered charge. And I believe the powdered charge is made of finely divided zirconium powder and potassium perchlorate. And when this is heated, that will generate a little puff of flame, heat and pressure, so the next step is how do you take that tiny puff of high energy pyrotechnic gas and use that to destroy a giant rocket? Well, you know, rockets are actually generally full of pretty high energy material, 
that has been tamed so that it exhausts out a rocket nozzle rather than out the side of the tank. So you just need to encourage it to misbehave. And the way you'll typically do that is you'll cut holes in the sides of the tank. And ideally, you will cut it at structurally important locations, which will cause the tanks to fail in a spectacular fashion and ideally involve the propellant charges mixing or sorry, the contents mixing. So an easy way to do this, and we see this on a Falcon 9, is a linear shaped charge which runs across the oxygen uh, fuel bulkhead. So that's common bulkhead. When you cut that there, it touches both tanks and it will encourage mixing and ideally, hopefully destroy the launch vehicle. The one time I think the uh, we saw a flight termination system used uh, by SpaceX was one of their vertical landing test vehicles in Texas when one of the, they lost, I can't remember what happened, but they lost control, it was going the wrong way and they destroyed it. So that was a perfect example of that kind of thing running. So these are linear shaped charges. What they are is they're a V-shaped piece of explosive with uh, that runs in a long direction and they use what's called the Monroe effect. This is basically a shaped charge. So you initiate the explosive at the top and the explosion runs down the arms and in the middle you've got a filler metal and the metal is pushed forwards and the shape of the explosion and the converging shock waves turns this into a hot high energy jet of material which is perfect for cutting through metal. This is the same principle that is used in many anti-tank weapons. So what you do is you just basically take that V shape and you stretch it out into a long charge. You initiate it at the peak of the uh, yeah, explosive at you know the pointy end at one end and that explosion runs along it in two dimensions and on one in one dimension or sorry in the profile dimension the uh, explosive is running down and generating that jet but it's also propagating linearly along the charge making sure that this jet of metal turns into like a sheet of metal that is cutting unzipping the rocket all the way uh, you know whatever direction it's going in fact the Saturn V had stage separations that were initiated using these kind of linear shaped charges these are at this point off the shelf products with you can buy various versions and various sizes to cut through whatever sizes of material is needed. They are used in fairing separation, stage separation. They are pretty well understood pieces of hardware and they're perfect for terminating a rocket. So yeah, these linear shaped charges were also found, say, on the space shuttle where they would be laid alongside of the oxygen tank and alongside of the hydrogen tank. And in the event that it was needed, it would you know, separate the tank and cause it to disintegrate. But the Space Shuttle, of course, had most of its thrust coming from those giant uh, solid rocket motors. And the thing with solid rocket motors is that you can't really shut those down. You know, you can't just turn off the propellant by closing the valves. Those things are going to burn. So again, best way to fix them is to have something like a linear shaped charge that just slices the tank open and disperses the propellant. And this is going to be a standard part of all these solid rocket motors. There was actually discussion or investigation of the possibility of using thrust termination ports in the solid boosters on the space shuttle. The idea is that uh, the gas, you know, you've got this chemical reaction that's going on inside this confined space where the solid rocket motor is, and it's venting out the, the nozzle. Well, if you open up ports at the top of the rocket in opposite directions, then you could cancel out the thrust and uh, let the thing burn itself out more quickly. Now they looked at this, but decided that it was too dangerous because the vehicle would not survive the, the forces involved as the thrust bled off and you had you know, forces going in all sorts of other directions. So they just basically said that they would destroy the solid rocket motors. And of course we saw that happen in the case of the Challenger disaster. After the vehicle broke up, the boosters were flying off in their own directions and they had to get terminated by the range safety officer. And this, of course, brings, uh, you know, does bring to home the fact that, uh, yeah, there are potential to destroy rockets with people on board. And in the case of the space shuttle, there weren't many options for the crew escaping that if the, if the disaster was triggered during the ascent under the solid rocket motors. Once they got rid of those, there were a few more options, but none of them were particularly good. In the case of things like uh, the Falcon 9 or the Atlas V with Starliner on top, at least now we have the ability for the spacecraft or the crew 
to shoot off before the flight termination system actually triggers. And of course, ideally, that's the kind of thing we would see in the case of Starship, that you would have the Starship separate from the booster and the booster then shut itself down. That's not what we saw a few days ago. So yeah, like if Starship, you know, if Starship did actually separate from the booster by firing its engines. That would probably be a pretty good way of terminating the booster itself. Uh, would certainly lead to destruction of the, the forward tank. While FTS are great to have for all sorts of emergencies, they can cause problems on their own. Uh, in December 1959, the third attempted launch of a Titan missile, the, uh, that rocket exploded four seconds after takeoff after vibrations caused a relay to clo momentarily close in the flight termination system and destroyed the rocket just above the pad. It was a spectacular event, as you can imagine. Also, just developing and standardizing these things can be problematic. There's a story that's told about getting Ares 1X uh, approved for a flight. They were going to use the same FTS that was used on the Space Shuttle boosters, but with a single booster you know, and the stack sitting on top of it, the, the vibration environment was going to be significantly different from that on the Space Shuttle. So they modeled that and they realized it was going to go beyond the ranges the system had been specced for after about 70 seconds. And that was going to be problematic. Now they had figured out that after 90 seconds, even if the booster did go off course at that point, it couldn't make it anywhere that would you know, be a problem. So they didn't worry about that. But 70 seconds, yeah, they had problems and they were worried that not only could it trigger early, it could inhibit itself accidentally, or it could set itself in a state where it said that explosives were inhibited, but they weren't, and so if they were going to recover it, that could be a problem. So they spent ages going back to the manufacturer of various pieces of hardware and making sure that everything had been specced in the environments that they were expecting, so they could minimize their amount of tests and actually make the Ares 1X fly. And while you may have an FTS on your rocket, you may not want to use it for other factors. A few years ago, there was an Ariane 5 launch, which due to a problem with its uh, programming, took a slightly more southerly trajectory than it should, and it ended up flying along the coast of uh, Guyana. And by the time they realized that this rocket was going off course, it was too late to trigger the flight termination system because they would have guaranteed to have dropped flaming debris into populated areas. So they didn't trigger the flight termination system. They allowed it to continue to orbit and both satellites actually made it to their final destination, although one of them had to reduce its lifetime because it needed extra propellant. So that's a rough overview of flight termination systems. There's a whole bunch of stuff out there, actually not that much good information, but we're glad that rockets come with these things. And uh, yeah, I'm glad that I don't have to worry about debris getting dropped on my house. I'm Scott Manley, fly safe.